we light this chalice as a symbol of our Unitarian tradition, inviting in the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of our commitment. So welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you chose to be with us here this morning. If this is your first time, uh, you're invited to have a cup of coffee with us after the service. And we ask that you sign our welcome book with your contact information so that we can let you know what else is happening in the community. We begin together in this service by creating and deepening into community by sharing our joys and sorrows. If you've had a profound joy or sorrow in this last week or since you were last with us, you're invited to come up to the table to light a candle and say a few words. morning for our faithful Karen who is usually here running around doing things before we start and uh, she's busy moving her son a little more work than she thought it was anyway I'd like to light a candle for her I would like to light this candle of uh, sorrow and concern for my dear friend Rita Moyer, who just lost her mother, and they're having their uh, services today, too. Um, and I'd like to also light this candle in joy and thanks that I pushed the button on my report this morning. <laughs> Last Friday, <clears throat> my lovely wife, Aline, was graduated at Selkirk College. Educated. Uh, educated in uh, textile arts and peace uh, studies. My name is Keith. Um, my uh, my father passed away on Thursday peacefully and and gently, and uh, it was a long time. As most of you know, it was a long time coming, but it, it went very smoothly in the end. This, however, is a candle of concern for myself and my loss because it will be a tremendous loss for me, and about ten or a hundred times more for my mom. So this is a kind of concern, most of all, for my mom. Celine and I, I actually graduated. I mean, I, I walked. Uh, I still have two months of school left, but uh, I just wanted to say that it was, um, I'm 72, and it was the first time I walked in any ceremony, and it was, it was quite special, and I'm glad I did it. And I felt like I did it for all of my, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, I'm going to cry now, 
and my um, my mother, all whose education was quite seriously uh, cut short. So. to light this candle of joy for the budding community that is the Nelson Spiritual Unitarian Center and Deborah for your coming here and spending time with us and it's so precious. Thank you. I'd like to light this candle out of a joy and concern. I, concern I missed yesterday's eventful day um, procedures and routines, but joy that I got to spend the time helping Marsha get her push the button. <laughs> and, uh, can't do both. My name is Mary, and I'm lighting this candle for my friend Sherry in Vancouver um, for sadness that her diagnosis is a few months to live, and for profound joy that we are such great friends, and I love her dearly. I'm lighting this candle for in gratitude for all the wonderful people who helped uh, the magic of this report that I just sent in happen. Um, at the last minute, my darling Dale, the last two days, and um, all across this project, the gifts have been great, and I have gratitude for that. The last candle that I light is for the joys and the sorrows that we each have, perhaps too tender to share, too private, but we acknowledge them with this candle. And I invite you to enter into a moment of prayer with me. Spirit of life, of love, our joys and woes are woven fine, as Blake says. Our hope and our agony is intertwined. May all who are in this room, may all who are known, and those who are unknown, who cross our path, be blessed with hope. May those that are hungry find the nourishment they seek. May those that are without shelter find warmth. May all who are suffering have the courage and the support 
to learn from it, move through into new light and love. So be it. Now we get to sing a little bit more. We're going to sing uh, 354. This is a song of celebration of community. It's called We Laugh, We Cry. It is a song about all the different parts of our lives with family, alone, and in community. Jacqueline, you'll go through the melody once. Mm -hmm. So um, there's three pages for this hymn, and um, in the little binders there is the music, and then for people who would prefer, there is just the words written out with the, with the verses. So whatever you find um, the easiest, um, and it goes like this. It goes. Shall we stand as we are willing and able? We can breathe better and sing better if we're standing. But not right now. Just one more. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
May I invite Ray up to tell us a story? A real treat. far enough away from the drum. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like my singing can lead the train right off the tracks. <laughs> Once upon a long, long time ago, when an ass was a donkey, not a politician. Anyway, <laughs> whoa, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> Time's coming, isn't it? <laughs> there was a donkey and a little dog, and they were great friends. And they lived on a farm together with a farmer. Now, as fate would have it, every day, the donkey and the farmer would go out in the field and they'd be hard at work all day long. And when the farmer came back in at the end of the day, the donkey was taken into the stables because that's where state donkeys like to sleep. The farmer would give the donkey some extra fresh hay to eat make sure the donkey was tucked in and sweet and happy. And then the farmer would go inside for his evening meal. Now everything was going along just wonderfully until one day the donkey began to wonder. I wonder what my friend the little dog is doing inside the house. So the donkey went up and peered through the farmhouse window. <laughs> oh, you might not believe this might not believe this, but the donkey saw his friend, the little dog, underneath the kitchen table. And the farmer was cutting off pieces of his evening meal and feeding them to the little dog under the table. And the little dog was so happy, his <coughs> tail was wagging back and forth, and he was so happy. But the donkey was heartbroken. I have to eat by myself. But that wasn't the worst of it. But the very next thing that happened was the farmer pushed himself back from the kitchen table. The little dog, I know you won't believe this, the little dog hopped right up into the farmer's lap. And the farmer began to rub behind the little dog's ears and the little dog's leg was jumping up and down the kitchen. Oh, he looked so unhappy. But the donkey was heartbroken. Nobody ever rubs behind my ears. But that wasn't the worst of it. But very soon the farmer got out of his chair. He walked off, across the floor, across the living room floor, all the way upstairs to his bedroom. And I know this never happens in your house, but the little dog jumped right up on the farmer's bed next to the farmer, and the two of them fell fast asleep. Oh, the donkey was heartbroken. Now I have to go inside. And I'm going to go in the stables, and it's cold, and I'm lonely. Oh, I don't want to be a donkey anymore. I don't think the donkey got much sleep that night. It took so much work trying to push that button. <laughs> we got up the next morning. It was like he could do nothing right at all. Not a thing. As they were walking through the fields, the donkey walked right through a fence they had built the other day. Walked right across the field they had just plowed. Then knocked the farmer right into a big hole. <laughs> farmer, what's wrong with my donkey? He was worried about his donkey, so he took the donkey back to the stables because that's where donkeys like to stay and be safe. Got the donkey some extra fresh hay to eat, and then the farmer went inside after making sure the donkey had everything the donkey needed. The donkey just couldn't take it anymore. He wasn't happy being a donkey. He wanted to be a little dog. And the more he thought about it, the more he knew he could make himself into a little dog. And as the evening glow was upon us, the donkey had had enough. He ran out of the stables. He ran at the farmhouse door. Bang! He knocked the door down and he ran around inside the house. Now there's a donkey running around inside. Can you imagine? He found his friend, the little dog, underneath the kitchen table. He ran in underneath the table and the table flew up in the air and the dinner went flying. The plates crashed down and the knives and forks were bouncing all over the place. 
the farmer did <laughs> what to do, but the donkey knew just what a little dog would do in a situation like this. He leapt right into the farmer's lap. <laughs> oh, the poor farmer, he fell right over backwards. His legs were kicking around up in the air and there was a donkey sitting right on his chest. The farmer had no idea what to do, but the donkey knew just what a little dog would do in a situation like this. Exactly. He went flying out of the kitchen, across the living room floor, all the way upstairs, and into the farmer's bed. Bang! A few moments later, the farmer and the little dog came upstairs to find the donkey amongst the ruins of the farmer's bed. And the farmer came right up to the donkey. You donkey! What are you doing? big tears in his eyes. I'm just so tired of being a donkey. I wish that I was a little dog. The farmer took a deep breath. Donkey. Don't you know that if you're not a donkey, I can't even be a farmer? Don't you know? I love you just the way you are. I love you just the way you are. Well, the donkey and the farmer and the little dog, they went downstairs and they gathered up all that was left of the evening meal. It was quite a mess. But they found enough that they packed it all into a picnic basket. And then they got some blankets and the farmer got some lamps and candles and they all went out to the stables together. And they had a picnic in the stables with the donkey. Then they pulled out the blankets, blew out the lamps and the candles. They curled up in the straw together and they all fell fast asleep. And you know, that donkey never felt like he was sleeping alone ever again. Wonderful story, Ray. Poor little donkey. <laughs> Our theme is belonging today. That was a story about how to find ways for donkeys and asses and <laughs> dogs and farmers and people to live together in a way that is right for each of them. Sometimes adjustments are needed. A little bit of adjustment. <laughs> We're now going to take uh, time to take an offering for the work that this center does uh, to support the meeting times, the buildings that we rent, and the work that this community does out in the wider world. We'll send around a basket. Thank you. generosity for the common good. We'll now sing the song that is the on the first page. From you I receive, to you I give.
We're now going to go into a time of deepening through silence and a few words together. That poor old donkey. <laughs> he just wanted a little bit more love. The farmer was oblivious. The dog was oblivious. They were just doing the things that farmers and dogs do. But that donkey wanted in. He wanted to belong to that family. I hope that you have in your life had an experience of being welcomed into a home or into a family or with a person or a place that you wanted to be with. Belonging to ourselves, welcoming ourselves as we are, faults and all, being in the aware center of the self is possible and is necessary. I offer you a Buddhist-inspired meditation on the center. I will speak each line three times and I invite you to repeat it silently to yourself or simply to just let it wash through you and feel it. I am the center. I am the center. I am the center. the center. You are the center. You are the center. We are the center. We are the center. We are the center. I am the center, you are the center, we are the center.
چیکار کنیم Have you ever been on the outside looking in? Have you ever been walking down a street at night, looking through windows that are lit up, perhaps seeing people inside what you imagine to be warm places, maybe having dinner, maybe laughing? Have you ever been lonely, so lonely your skin hurts? Have you ever been so empty that you would do anything to fill yourself up? We humans need some pretty basic stuff. According to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of human need, once those basics of shelter, food, and safety are met, the next human necessity is belonging. We need to be needed. Our brains, our neurological perspective are hardwired to be in relationship. From our very first breath, we're designed to seek out our basic survival. How can you deny the crying baby? Or how can you not smile back at that giggling, wiggling mass of human smallness. The universe has created us to take in sensory information so that we can refine our basic survival need to be in connection with others. This programming to belong is physical, emotional, mental, intellectual, and spiritual. It is both basic instinct and spiritual yearning. And yet, and this is not new information to you, we are at a time in our society, most especially in North America, in which we have created a world that actively disconnects us from each other, that breeds fear and distrust, Energies that ultimately separate us from each other. So our instincts to connect are blocked or shut down. And so many, many people today are lost or lonely or feeling isolation and emptiness and barely know why. In 2006, there was a study published in American Sociological Review showing a decline in close relationships that was so fast that the sociologists were shocked. The numbers were compared to a similar study done in 1985, and it was found that the percentage of people 
who had a person to whom they could confide in had dropped from one in 10 in 1985 to one in four in 2006. <coughs> so that was 11 years ago. And there hasn't, as far as I know, been another study, but if you extrapolate, it would not be without possibility that it's now down to one in two people do not have someone that they could trust in to confide in, in our society. To me, that's truly terrifying. So much disconnect. So much not feeling like you belong somewhere. That you can trust other people. I mean, no wonder that loneliness is that number one concern in this continent. So we're built, programmed in our DNA, DNA to live with other people, to need other people, and to find our personal and spiritual fulfillment with and through other people. And yet here we are creating a world that's thwarting us from getting this need met. And so to compensate depression, leading to suicide, addictions, to fill the emptiness, are all on the rise. There are alternatives. There are solutions. And one solution is right here, in this community. This community is exactly what is needed as a response to that great yearning for connection. So I see as a visitor, and for those that, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself, I'm the Reverend Deborah Thorne, um, and I've been invited in um, my second visit up to Nelson and with the Nelson Unitarian Spiritual Center to talk about being Unitarian and to help support the emerging, growing community here. So what I see in my visits is a community that is responding to this need for connection and belonging. I see that you are in the process of creating a sanctuary, a, perhaps an oasis, a home for those seeking meaningful connection for those who are able to hear that small, still voice inside that's drawing them out of a singular life, perhaps a life of loneliness and isolation, or simply being one person, you have opened your door intentionally and said, please come in, you are welcome. I believe not only do our Unitarian communities have the spiritual food to feed hungry souls, but that it is our moral responsibility to provide that nourishment, that connection, that meaningful connection for all who ask, for all who show up. So let me allow me to create an, an image of that process that moves a person from that outer world into the center. Think of it as a series of uh, concentric circles that you move from one through one, th through one threshold into the next. The simple act of walking through the door, metaphorically or concretely, ignites this series of processes. Not all of us are so confident that when we walk into a new space or into a new group of people that we immediately feel accepted and acknowledged, feel seen, feel heard. Most of us, many of us, when we walk into a new setting, come with a whole bag of doubts and questions. That tender heart seeking connection asks, will these people accept me as I am? 
Will my age or gender be acceptable? Will my poverty or my privilege be a problem? Will my ethnicity separate me from others? Will my spiritual life or the lack thereof be a barrier to connect with these people? Through research into why people stay with a community or only drop in once, it's understood that when a person walks through the door, crosses that first threshold, despite our intense desire to connect, that person is often looking for the reason not to stay. Isn't that extraordinary? <laughs> you know, I, uh, it, it seems contradictory, I think, to what I've just said, that we're hardwired for connection, that need to belong. But rather, I think it speaks huge volumes to how important belonging is to us. Right? How important it is to know that the possibility of belonging exists and is safe. And it's like every relationship. Right? The more important and meaningful that relationship is, the greater the risk that you might lose it. Because no sooner do we find what we need, we do run into the fear of the risk of losing it. So as one crosses that first threshold, at the same time that those emotional sensors are out there asking, sensing all those questions, the brain's also seeking a connection. <coughs> so the thoughts, you know, do these, do this group, do their values, do their principles align with mine? Do they really respect the diversity of spiritual beliefs? Are they committed to walking their talk and making this a more just world? Do they do what they say? <coughs> if you don't greet and meet each person that comes through your community with authenticity and genuine warmth, I challenge you that you're not practicing your beliefs, your faith, your principles. This is the spiritual practice of hospitality, a deep, <coughs> long-term, revered practice of hospitality. If you don't smile at the stranger or say hello, I think you're choosing fear over love. Frankly, you, the Nelson Unitarian Spiritual Center, would not be living into your vision of this community, stated in your bylaws, which states, <laughs> just reminding you, this is what you have, that your interdependence calls you to greater love and justice. Your interdependence calls you to greater love and justice. It's alive in that word, interdependence. Every person that you meet today, known or unknown, in this room or beyond, is needed. You need them, although you may not know how your life depends on them, nor how theirs depends on you. As this, Chris, this community grows, this is the spiritual mystery that you are committing to, interdependence. This is the path that leads us to the center of the center. And by surrendering yourselves in a conscious way to that mystery of interdependence in human relationship, you are embarking on an important, if not crucial, healing journey for yourself, your community, and perhaps even our planet.
So the seeker, the visitor, the person walking through the door, has now passed over two thresholds. They've arrived, they've been welcomed, you have found a community, they have found a community of like-minded people, they've been met with kindness and respect, they've realized that their values maybe will be, are aligned, they're ready to become involved, ready to deepen into this journey of belonging. I am the center, <coughs> you are the center, we are the center. That's the process. So I invite you to recall a time when you felt that shift, any time in your life where you felt that shift from being on the periphery of something and stepping into the center. When you went through that process of realizing that these are my people, this is my place. As part of that process, one is the recognition, okay? The other part of that process is a decision, freely made. The freedom to choose is a power, a very potent power. So this community is not a cult. And I say that <laughs> because you're not being coerced or forced into doing anything. You are making a choice. You are exercising the power of that choice. You are choosing to belong with your freedom into something that you have reflected on and become aware of. That, that making a choice comes up in a wedding ceremony. It's the, one of those legal requirements that as a, a, a person that conducts weddings, I always have to ask, and that is, do you come to this moment freely? I, you're not being coerced into this. You're not being pushed into it. This is your choice. It's a very powerful moment to say yes. Mm -hmm. This is my choice to enter into this new world. As the Nelson Unitarian Spiritual Center prepares to set up the process for membership, this will become a decision that each person will be invited to make somewhere in this next year. It is that stepping into the center of the center, that sense of deepening the belonging. And for so, becoming a member of something, for some people, is like a, putting down an anchor somewhere that holds them despite the storms and the calms of everyday life. For others, becoming a member completes a journey of some sort where they can then sort of relax, exhale, and go, oh, here I am. I made it. For some, becoming a member makes really very little difference because they've sort of gently slid through each of those thresholds and just find themselves in the right place. And there will always be some people who, are, who make the decision not to become members, who are uncomfortable for some reason, and yet they never stop contributing, pledging, serving in many different capacities. A community needs every single one of those people and needs to accept that everyone comes as they are and accepts what they have to give. Donkey, dog, <laughs> farmer. 
The what? chickens. Picnic. 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 Exactly. <laughs> so the people in this room and those that are on their way or can't be here today have chosen to be part of an intentionally diverse liberal religious community. As you are yourselves in the middle of the process and understanding what it means to be this community, you're also simultaneously taking on the responsibility of creating an authentic, respectful foundation for others to enter into. The more aware that you can be in this process and responsibility, the greater your clarity and inevitability of the success of your venture. As you're also choosing to be a spiritual community, your collective self-awareness is both your personal work and your collective journey. They must go hand in hand. As with any journey, there is going to be moments of insights and moments of challenges, times of tension and times of celebration. Be clear what your vision of this center is so that you can return to it, lean into it, and take strength from it. You have set your sail into that mystery of interdependence with your roots firmly in love and justice. And so you will grow in depth and resilience. You are the center. Blessings on the journey as you are building your way forward. We are going to uh, sing just the first and fourth verse of this next song because we're coming to our end. It's 1017. It's called We Are Building a New Way. It's, it's and the very last song in the Bible. Last song in the dual tank. And um, Jacqueline, as she's done before, she's going to just play the, the melody through so that we can get a sense of it. And then we'll stand and sing. It's pretty gospelly, bluesy, and and there's a tendency. I'm going to go a little slow just to teach you it, but when we sing it, it's going to pick up a bit. So, but it goes like this. Um, you're going to have to sing my verses now. I have no voice.
invite you, I invite you to stay and, and sing if Jacqueline's willing to keep playing later, but we're going to draw this uh, service to a conclusion. I thank you for being here in heart and mind and body today. Our closing words. The mission of this faith is to teach the fragile art of hospitality, to revere, revere both the critical mind and the generous heart, to prove that diversity needs not mean divisiveness, and to witness to all that we must hold the whole world in our hands. I extinguish this flame, but not the warmth of community, the light of truth, nor the fire of commitment. These we take into our hearts and into the world, and I hope you come back again. Thank you. Announcements. Please, please feel free to sit here. <laughs>